So this is Bannister Creek. So um, Sandy, who is sitting, Sandy, can you stand, please, for a minute? <laughs> Sandy is my shadow, my ally, um, environmental spokesperson, also my neighbour from only 100 metres away. In we both live equidistance to Bannister Creek and it was Sandy who first came to me um, back in 1994, I think it was originally, uh, that we had the big pollution events and then 95 again and in 95 we had a really big pollution event and so that's what the, ins the real um, pressure point was for us to do something. You can't just sit back and watch this uh, all nature, nature being wiped out. Dead birds, dead frogs, uh, birds dying in the night. And you've never, you, you just don't want to hear what a, what a wetland bird sounds like when it's dying at night time. In fact, we got up thinking it was a kitten crying or cats crying, only to find it was dead birds or dying birds. And um, it still, sorry, it still gets me because it was horrible. And we couldn't understand why somebody wasn't doing something about it. Um, I come off a farm right down in the lower southwest in Northcliffe. Sandy, I think, originally comes from England. Um, but has spent a lot of time around here as well. And um, we just have that connection, we've built that connection to nature. Um, but we've also come, a whole group of other local people came with us on that, pro on that adventure. So in 1995, we actually started our first group. And, um, and we met up with people like Pat Hart, Mary Gray, um, at the city of Canning after we were... I think they went there and asked who are the people most vocal about Bannister Creek and we were invited to a meeting and so that's how it really started going um, but we already had the group going by then. So this is the creek. I'm going to take you through the restoration process. So um, this is what we hang our hat on. It is the creek we love. And um, that was what it looked like before we started. This picture is actually um, up in, I'll turn this on. Um, it's actually up, this is Brampton Way and over that side is Bywood Way in Linwood. Um, and it's the top of the channel. You can see it's very narrow, it's a drain. There's lots of those drains around the backs of people's houses in the suburb. The suburb was developed in the 60s, and sorry, late 60s, early 70s, as an English migrant um, place for people to come to and start a community. So um, the Water Corporation uh, or the Water Board in those days dug the channels to drain the, and it actually had been dug for a very long time. It goes right back to the mid 1900s when this whole area was drained to try and make the land more viable for farming because it was just full of tiger snakes and most people left because of the tiger snakes. So um, good on the tiger snakes. <laughs> um, there's not that many left now. Keep an eye on, um, I'm just going to try and do, I want to touch, I want to do that spot thing. There it is. Is it working? Can't see it. Oh, there it is. But it doesn't work on the screen. <laughs> anyway, keep an eye on the red circle. Um, little things will pop up like that and you'll see that tree as the um, process changes. So, um, oh, while I'm actually, oh, what I will say is that when we did do the work, um, it was not before we had already had the circle of elders come down onto, the, onto site 
and walk the waterway with us. In those days we had a really good circle of elders and the city had embraced that, bringing them down. And we walked the area with their wives, the, the women and men, um, with their families. And they had scones at my house. And it was a lovely day. And we were sort of talking about what we could do to fix this drain. If, if we could do anything, what could we do? And, um, and they sat down um, separate to us um, in a patch of sand and sort of drew a diagram on the, in the sand, which kind of looked like, oh, she's covered up my drawing spot. <laughs> That's all right. It kind of looked like that. So a bit like the Waggle. And th their principle was you only have to remember one thing when you're doing this work. And that is to make sure when you finish that any reptile that enters that waterway or can leave the waterway and get back into the waterway. So if you think about that, you think about a turtle trying to get up and back in that. They're pretty, they're pretty amazing. They will get up through that grass, but it's not easy. And certainly none of the goannas can. So that was our principle to work with the whole time. And once that's inside of you, it goes with you forever. Um, and for whatever, whatever waterway you're in, the principle is there. <coughs> so before you do anything when you're working with these sort of areas is we were introduced to the catchment. What is a catchment? Well, this catchment is 2,300 hectares and it's pretty, it wasn't so urbanised then as it is now. Um, it's, that's not an up-to-date, hello, Mark. Um, um, I think this was about 2005 or something like that. You can see in the middle, the pink bit is the industrial area. So Bale Road, Bannister Road, any of those that know that area. That was originally Bannister Lagoon. It was known as Bannister Lagoon. And the only bit of it left is the Welbeck Lake and a little bit of Tom Bateman wetlands, which are right next to Roe Highway, if anyone knows that area. So it extends right down to nearly to Canning Vale Prison. To give you a perspective of, of just how far. And the top end comes in not very far from Low Key Cafe in Riverton, near the Riverton Bridge. So it's about mm, 500 metres upstream from the Riverton Bridge, old Riverton Bridge. Big uh, complex catchment, sandy, and a lot of that sand moves down through the system very easily. And it takes with it whatever it can pick up on the way. So that's a bit of an aerial graphic to show you where that catchment is in the perspective of the Wongong catchment. It's all part of the Canning catchment. Canning is a massive catchment. And so um, there are lots of these little satellite catchments all the way. That's a more recent um, go at trying to define the catchment after more intense urbanisation. Um, but because we don't have a catchment management organisation in government anymore, um, it does make it very difficult. These are the things that we're not doing anymore. Um, went by the wayside for a while. It is just a little fly in the ointment there it is there, Bannister Creek. This is the Swan Canning area and its subcatchments from a, uh, this is not including the lakes system. It was just the river that was to give you an idea of just, it's a little one, 
but it's very significant and it pushed out a lot of nutrient and heavy metals. Lots of pollution come down that system. And so some people went out looking for a way to arrest that problem. So one of the things you'll notice, the blue line is the water corp. That's the main drainage system and that's, what, that's how it works. It's a split system. So in our main waterway, which is running down here, this is Bannister Creek that we've just seen, that's Whaleback Golf Course. So it splits here, half of the catchment runs out into this industrial catchment right down to the markets. And this other little bit here ends up all the way down into Livingston and Ranford, uh, down the Nicholson Road area. Yes? Is that also rain, like wastewater rain catchment as well? Is it wastewater rain. or rain catchment? Yes, it is. Because the main drain, the, the whole reasoning for main drains is to make sure that the water can get to the river after we've urbanised the area. And, um, and there are little um, catchment, little um, basins on the way. Well, we target those basins to um, do our rehabilitation because they're good points, good areas where you can do planting and, um, and the plants do the work for you and you can bring um, lots of life back. So this gives you an idea of the catchment report for 2017. This is how they used to measure success or measure what was coming into the river, what was causing problems in the river, blue-green algae blooms, fish deaths, all sorts of reasons why we monitor nutrient load in the river. Um, and we looked at things like percentage of cleared area 2005 it was 86% of our catchment was cleared. Now that's actually beyond the realms of survival for any catchment. And it's worse than that now because we've had some of the area that was um, set aside has been since cleared. Um, and so we did set you know, started pushing that issue about stopping any clearing or any tree loss. And now the city's got a biodiversity plan and the idea with that is to try and get more canopy back. But we need more than canopy. We need bush and we need wetlands. And so um, that's a more up-to-date version of the green and of the um, what's green and what's Conservation and natural is what the green areas are. The rest of the green bits are playgrounds and fields and things like that. So this was our pollution issues. This was just down the road from my house. And that is Melinda Snowball up there, for those who know her. Uh, she lived on the other side of that bridge, not far away. And this would happen on a regular basis, usually at Easter um, and at times when you can't get somebody out to deal with it. You can't bring the authorities out. You can't get samples taken because it's public holidays. Good time to wash out your factory. Unfortunately, we have never actually found the culprit. We've had many um, suggestions as to who it might be and what we've had one or two detergent company. There was a problem with them, but it was coming through the wrong line. So we knew it wasn't them. They still had a problem, but it wasn't them actually causing this problem. And so with that detergent, that is just what's used. It's not the detergent that's the detergent is a problem, it's a serious problem, especially for frogs. But it's what else it washes down that's an even bigger problem. We don't know because it mixes it all up and drops it down into the sediment. And so you don't know what's come down the system. Massive problem and it still is a problem. 
The only difference is we've raised the height of the water here so it doesn't drop so far, so you don't notice it as much. It's probably not clever, really, but it was more ecological. So these are the other issues we had in the catch in the reserve. We're talking about the Bannister Creek Reserve, or it's now known as the Bannister Creek Park. Um, that's me and one of the volunteers, Dawn, and my dog, Jackson. You will see Jackson, he pops up all over the place. This is down by, um, a little bit further down the uh, reserve. And this is where we started. Watercorp had already decided to come in here and clean out the channel, which would, they would bring in a big excavator, because this is a main drain, dig out the dirt, the sediment, and dump it on the side. And so the sides start building up again. You've done all your work to keep it flat and they start building up. And of course, it ends up back in the creek anyway. So it really didn't make sense. Um, uh, <coughs> and I can't, I can't remember where the mulch came from, but it's not my favourite thing, especially near a waterway. And the, the plants on the left, anybody know what you think the plants might be on the left? Blackberry. Pardon? Blackberry. blackberry and morning glory. Absolutely. It's blackberry with morning glory going over, glowing, <laughs> growing over the top of it, um, just to get a bit more height. <coughs> Pretty intense. And as Pat said, you know, when we first muted the idea of cleaning that out, she just went, "Are you mad?" You know, do you know what you're handling? No, we didn't, but we, we do now. And we've succeeded, so. But it took a long time to nut that one out. And, um, and it's slowly, slowly, you can't do these things. We set about a 20 year plan right at the very beginning. We knew it wasn't gonna happen quickly. Don't have the money for a start. Um, but yeah, we knew, and we had a lot of learning to do. As Taylan said, I was a nurse. It's a little bit different to this, uh, but it's not really. If you think about how your, you work, what, how your body works, and what you need, and where your waste goes, it's very similar to a river and a waterway. It's not dissimilar at all. The wetlands are its kidneys, the leaves are its lungs, and if you don't have the right leaves, you don't have the right animals, and it all gets all mucked up and choked up. Same as when we smoke, really. I'll throw that one in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, paperbark forest, lots of lovely, magnificent, very tall paperbarks, and the only reason they're tall is because they had to grow above the blackberry. So they became extended um, much taller than what they should be. There's other um, eucalypts and things there as well. There's a very young Matt Grimbley who still works at Circle, <coughs> has been working. He came as a volunteer and um, you might recognise, some people might recognise the gentleman at the other end as well who runs his own business in land care, in landscaping, all um, cut their teeth um, with Circle and Bannister Creek. So we started, we started the Bannister Creek group first and then it was pretty good organisation. We've done it really well and started to employ people and then it was very obvious that we had an advantage over the other groups. So Pat sort of started the push. <laughs> we need somewhere where we can do this on a bigger scale. And department, Swan River Trust was right behind us as well. And then we found the circle building. So that's a whole nother story. And hopefully that story will get told later this year because the 20 years has come up for circle this year too, which is fantastic. So what we were doing here is hand removing blackberry. But we were shown the way by two volunteers who were already hand removing blackberry 
and had mastered the art of doing it, so much so that poor old Celia Canning struggled to actually take the stuff away. Um, so, but yes, it was all hand removed in this particular section. We had other issues. The catchment was hardening up and the rain events, the waterway was getting fuller and fuller. That bridge is the little footbridge at Bywood Way and it was washed away two times, two or three times, three times, um, completely washed away. The water actually comes up higher than that and the table and chairs went for a little swim as well um, and you know, they would rebuild it and put it back in the same spot. So um, it was pretty daunting. And now if you go down there, you can't actually, you can't actually stand here anymore. It's all um, just bush. It's beautiful. So um, at high velocity, the water was moving very, very fast. Very dangerous if a child fell in that or even an adult. Um, and there were people who would go down in there. Um, surfboards. And they didn't realise that there's a weir at the other end where they're going to drop over the surf, you know, and say, ah, get out of the water, you idiots. You know? But that's what you do. You know, it's, it's just incredibly dangerous. So this is that footbridge, <coughs> that side. Sorry, it's a bit blurry. The picture is really old and it's the only one we've got. <coughs> Keep an eye on the drain. Um, now you can go to that footbridge and you can watch this happen. So that was 1997. This is August 2000. So this is when we actually started the Living Streams project, which is what it was called, transforming Bannister Creek um, into a living stream. And the first thing we did was take out the kaikuya. So it was sprayed, um, but before it was sprayed, a whole heap of the area on that side was scalped because they wanted the um, kaikuya, the city wanted the kaikuya to cover Odenia. So that's where it came from, to cover the uh, waste. It used to be a waste, um, place there and they used to use it to cover the tip. So um, we tried to get as many places for things to go to so we didn't waste very much at all. This was a massive project for that era, um, never been done before in on such a large scale. There was a small one in Bayswater, small living stream in Bayswater, which we learnt some, we learnt what not to do from because you know you all, you learn, and there's things that I've learnt, we've learnt through this process. Um, so you can see it was pretty um, interesting place. Um, we had to have a vision because there was people living around there. They weren't all supportive of what we were doing. In fact, there was one gentleman who actually raised the idea in the first place to turn it into a living stream. But he worked for Water Corporation. And so when we actually came to do the work, he got cold feet and got really quite upset by the fact that he was going to lose um, the lawn across the road. And maybe we shouldn't <coughs> be doing that. It was too risky. And yes, it was. There was a lot of risk involved. But it took three years in the planning um, to get it through and Susan Harris um, drew this drawing um, to so that we could explain to people this is what it might look like in 20 years. In fact it looked like that at 10 years not 20 and so so much so that she came back to the site and saw her art there um, a few years uh, and not, about 20 years uh, down the track I was there with her and she got very angry about that art being used in places where it wasn't meant for because she actually couldn't, re didn't realise that's how much the bush had grown, that it was real and it n that art had never been moved. And so she 
had quite some time to get her head around, wow, this is actually, um, it belongs here. I hadn't gone and taken her art and used it somewhere else, which of course is not the right thing to do. And so um, it was a good lesson for us to realise, wow, you know, it even tricked the artist. So that's the same site, um, January 2001. And we just put the block sedge in, which is all this um, sedges and rushes. First time a Pace had a Pace Nurseries in Fremantle um, had grown block sedges and it was a real challenge for them. We nearly outstocked their, the walls of the, the nursery. There wasn't very many nurseries around in those days. And a pace, you know, collected local seed and they grew local plants. Um, and, um, and it set a process in place, a uh, beginning of lots of other things happening. So, however, this stuff, which is coconut fibre, was an absolute disaster. And so, like, you learn from things. Uh, we discovered that this stuff, it was stitched with nylon thread, which was likened to fishing line. So when you cut it to shape it around this area, it's like the hem of your dress coming undone. And we didn't realise that as the birds move around, later on that it would all end up in the waterway and we'd go to walk in the waterway and you'd get caught up in all of this. So we had a job to do and that was to remove as much of it as possible. Um, by then the coconut fibre had gone, so what it was there for had gone, it didn't last very long at all and we didn't even need to do it as it turned out, but that's the learning. So we were able to say to people, please don't use coconut fibre. Not this stitch stuff. It's just dreadful. And it's still there today. There are patches where we find it and you pull it up and it's, it's supposed to break down in full sun. But it's a restoration project. It's never going to be in full sun. <laughs> I, it's, the plants are going to grow pretty quickly. So we did have to put a lot of um, mulch down and that was just simply because there was a dust problem. It was very dry. We had um, seven months of no rain during this project. Well, we did have, no, we did have one little shower, which caused us a bit of grief, but we'd already finished the main waterway. So you can see in two August, <coughs> that's how quickly it all started to come back. And we planted and planted and planted and planted and planted with lots of volunteers, thousands and thousands and thousands. 2003, it's almost astonishing to see the rate of growth, plant growth. And later on we worked out why. Because we already have a ground, polluted groundwater coming through that's full of phosphorus. And what do plants love? A bit of liquid phosphorus. We certainly never used any fertiliser. And my biggest worry then was, will the plants overgrow and then 20 years down the track start falling over because they haven't put good roots down. They're getting too much food. But that hasn't proved to occur. So we had beautiful photographs like this taken by Georgia Davies. Um, that's actually in the stream and those plants grew like nothing on earth. And then slowly, as the shade comes in, they get tucked away and they're not so thick. And it's a whole progression thing. Um, so that's 2007 and we go on, 2014. You wouldn't believe that's the same place, but this is the same space, same place below the riffle. And so when we s constructed the waterway, we put in a couple of riffles. So a riffle is a rocky crossing and they are really tricky to install and get right so that the water doesn't go round them. 
because it will try. Um, and the idea is to get the aeration, water aeration helps the, um, it helps the um, bugs and things that live in the water, the jilgies, the rocks are a bonus, but this is not a rocky landscape, so we've added rock, because normally it would be wood. This, this landscape, Bassendine sand, it would be woody debris that would be doing this work, um, which breaks down. So we need a bit more of a permanent structure. We've never had to add anything to this riffle, these riffles. They have been there for 20 years and we've never had to do anything. We did leave a pile of rocks next to each riffle, didn't we, Sandy? With the deliberate thing for the children to be able to throw rocks in and be able to build <laughs> things. Because it was very open, you know? It was a paradise for kids, absolute paradise. We'll show you some photos of them in there. So that's the same little point again. This is 2014. You can see a bit of green up there and that's because we had a weed come into the stream and we had to barricade the waterway to stop it spreading. 2016, 21, 22. And see that rotten callistamine still there, Talulin. <laughs> <laughs> it's on this side. At that, There's another one further up. You've taken that one out. We've still got that one up there. That's the King's Park special. It's a weed. It's turned into a terrible river weed. So be very careful with it when you're planting it on a verge because the seed goes down the stormwater drain and runs into the rivers. Yeah? Is that Linwood? It is in Linwood. <laughs> yes, it is in Linwood. Yeah, it's we were planting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um Bywood Way is this side and Brampton is that side. Um, so, back up, there's Brampton Way, Bywood Way. We're going to look downstream now. Um, so, um, this was what it used to look like. And keep an eye on the um, poor old paper bark on the right hand side. There's another one on the left and it's still there. It's doing really, really well. It gets really ugly when you do this work. Um, you, you have to just take a breath and be there and make sure the machines only do so that we worked on the outside, didn't touch the waterway until later, did as much of the soil removal as possible. We had to send um, – God, I can't remember the stats – it was something like – 167 double semi-trailers. How many? 167 double semi-trailers of sand. White pool sand, white beach sand it was. It was so white and it went to build Orong Road. So it, the whole project was delayed a year. So we had plants that were much bigger than what we expected because the nursery had to hold them for a year just simply because we couldn't find somewhere for the soil to go to. It had to go somewhere and had to be used. The ironic thing is it buried a wetland. So that's what hurt, but we were doing so much good stuff that we get enough karma back that it's okay. <laughs> so... Um, there it is again. You can see we have now taken that, started that waggle, that nice bend in the waterway. And I was there every day, let me tell you. Um, you do not leave. This is a lesson for anyone doing any work in a waterway with a machine. A man or woman on a machine, you be there because they don't necessarily know what you want. They've got a map, they've got a design to work to, but the ground can do funny things. The situation can change. And if you're not there, they might decide to go a little bit further than what they should. 
and we, that actually happened. The one time I had to go and pick up my daughter from hospital, I left the site for two hours, came back and they had gone right up to the bridge instead of staying back where the pipe was, where you could see where we'd taken out all of, done the spraying, spray job. That was the stop of the project. Don't interfere with the soil around the bridge because you might upset it and you can't put it back once it's done. And they did. <coughs> so I was a little bit annoyed when I got back. So you can see the riffles gone in, in the middle there. And that started to pull the water back. And that's what it's meant to do. Slow the water down so you get a nice gentle um, movement. Revegged. Plants are growing real fast. This is still there. You can go to that site and stand there and look down. There's the old paper bark that I was talking about that was on the left hand side. And there he is again. To the, that's 2002. It's just, it's, it, it still it gobsmacks me. You can still see the foam on the top of the water. That's all pollution. It shouldn't be like that. I've told for a long time that it's natural, but it is not natural, not at all. So they grew, the plants grew so much. And yeah, it rains. And we had a few weeds coming up. Weeds were our biggest, one of, it, one of the issues, but it wasn't too bad. It wasn't as bad as we thought. And when we we're doing this project, a very famous river man who passed away way too early, Luke Penn, Dr. Luke Penn, said to me when he came down on the site when we were starting, oh my God, Julie, the weeds are going to eat you up. And he said, but one day the canopy will touch and then everything will start to sort itself out. And so I've been waiting for that day and it has happened. So we're not quite there yet in that photo, not quite there. Nearly, the canopies are nearly touching. We are touching and we have darkness over the waterway. There are bits of light in between. It's just beautiful inside. When you go down in there, see, now the photos don't change much. They don't look so impressive, but it's pretty cool. And so, when you walk down in there, it's a complete closed canopy here and there, down the system. And that's when the water stays nice and cool and all your bugs and your frogs and your jilgies and everything else and the turtles um, come back. So going back to turtles, while we were at the stage of, I think it was a year later, just a year later, we were weeding on the edge of the waterway, Georgia and I, and on your butt because it was down the slope. And I, something crawled on my hand and I did the, I'm not really good with cockroaches. <laughs> so I thought it was a cockroach, so I flicked it away. It's like, ah, you know, she laughs because she was really good with everything. And um, it was a baby turtle and it was just, that big and they and then I looked around us and she's George is going look 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 they're all coming out and moving right down to the waterway and I had never seen that and I still have never seen it again because once the vegetation's there they move in underneath the vegetation you can't see them it's very rare you see one and so it's really cool and we were able to let the indigenous people know straight away what had happened. And they were amazed that just in that year, one year of plants growing makes that much difference. And it was just, just a moment where you just go, yes, <laughs> we've done that. You know, it's awesome. There's the team. That was our work team and some of these people um, Steve Atwell in the red shirt, hugely supportive from the city of Canning, was there for, 
I first met him in 92. I think he came in 91. And um, I was a thorn in his side, very much so, for a long, long time. But we got along really well. There is um, Colin Leake, Mary Ross, who was still back at Canning, um, Bill Till, Kim Richardson, um, Suzanne, who was from Alcoa, because we were able to do this project because we got a grant in those days through the Swan Alcoa Land Care Program. So they donated money to Swan River Trust and that money came out to community groups and we needed an icon project and I happened to be at the Sandringham Hotel on the night but we had already had a meeting two weeks earlier with the, all the stakeholders, the people who there's nine different stakeholders for this waterway, by the way. So that's a lot of different groups and organisations you have to meet with. Sitting around the table, we were discussing, you know, this project, this big idea of a living stream project, and it had been costed. So we knew we needed $120,000. And they all sort of said with glee, this is 2000, you know, or before that. 97, 98. When you've got the first 200, when you've got the first 50 jewellery, come and tell us and we'll match it. Two weeks later, <laughs> we got 60,000 guaranteed. And just because we went to a meeting and we're in the right place at the right time, that's good karma. And so we, I rang him up. And said, guess what? We've got 60,000. And you can imagine what he said. <laughs> I don't have to repeat that. And, um, and he goes, really? I said, yep, we've got 60,000. We're going. When can we have a meeting? And so from then, you know, it was then they had to take it to council. It had to be, you know, then they realised we were really serious. And um, the project needed to be done. So it was awesome. Wonderful people. Um, these two guys here, Tim and Phil, were the first bush crew for the city of Canning. We pushed really hard for that as well, to have a bush crew. And um, Judy Fisher here was our first coordinator before I decided to take it on and leave, let my nursing go over time. And uh, yeah, there were some amazing people there and so, and volunteers as well. So, I'm glad we took that photo. It was hard to get. Um, whoopsie. <coughs> and of course the kids talking about the ripple. That was the scouts. This little fella here is Jake Pickerskill. He's now the um, general manager of Martin's Environmental Services. He was seven when he started working with Bannister Creek Group on that project. So you can change people's lives in doing stuff like this. His father changed his job. He was a panel beater and went to work with Martin's Environmental as an environmental officer. He went off to, actually did seed first, Kim seed I think first. But he gathered the confidence that there was a job in this area. You didn't have to just work in a nursery if you wanted to be in horticulture or growing something. So when you set about to do this sort of work, you don't know who you're going to touch. And that's the joy because you touch thousands of people and you make a difference to their life, a positive difference to their life. Well, it's making a positive difference to your life, of course, too, which is cool. There he is again. This is his brother. And this was a photo shoot for Alcoa. And um, yeah, that's mum at the back there, planting. She's the secretary, still the secretary of Circle, of Bannister Creek Group, sorry. And, um, and yeah, they're still prominent members of our, of our team. Outside of the waterway itself, out into the catchment, this was one of the basins. Um, that was Tom Bateman, that's what it looked like um, before the work was done before Roe Highway went through. 
is fenced off and this, this water in here ran into Bannister Creek. So that was the next step up for us to get to. That's what it looks like today from the air. And so actually it looks way better than that because that's 2006. Um, that's Row Highway. When Row Highway was being built, a gentleman called uh, Carl Carew, the late Carl Carew, has passed away a couple of years ago. He was an awesome man and he, again, no training, just know, knew what to do, knew how to work with main, main roads and changed how main roads deal with stormwater forever. They have done amazing work down the freeways and that's all because of Carl and what Carl did inside that organisation. And he wasn't employed by them, he was just a contractor. And his job before? Making beds. Not as in bed making, as in constructing beds. He had a business in that. So you never know what you can do. It's amazing. And this is all, so the water comes in here, that's that basin. Goes in under here, it's filtered through, right around, round, back under, back through all this system here, back around. And so it's touching all the sedges and rushes and habitat for amazing habitats, fantastic space. And that's what it looks like now, 2020. It's pretty amazing. It's got a bit of a copa going on there. That's what the green is in the middle of it, if you're wondering. Um, which is a pest, but um, one of those plants we can't always deal with. Another basin we worked on was out in Canningvale. So Canvale Lake, we call it. The city calls it something else. Wittenberg, no. Another name anyway, t to do with one of the other roads that are there. But it's a water court basin and a city of Canning basin because both drain into it. There was nothing in this area here and you couldn't dig it up, can't do anything because of acid sulfate soil. So it was oozing acid on the ground. There was dead frogs. And so we decided to plant it and that's the best thing you can do for it, is to plant, 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 plant. And in the meantime, we did a lot of science as well. So there was a lot of pollution coming through that system. We set up barriers to soak up that pollution. Lots of that stuff being done. There's some of the bird life. That's the amount of silt that comes in. That's a constant process because the area was being built and no one, the laws on, match, on keeping sediment out of stormwater systems in Western Australia is extremely poor. It's the poorest in the country. If you go to the Eastern States, you get a fine if you don't have a barricade around the stormwater pipe when you're building a house or doing any even landscape work to your garden. If you don't put a barricade around the stormwater system, you can get an instant fine. Mm. So we have nothing like that here. We've tried. God, have we tried. Not too late to try. No, it is not. But, and this is another basin. This is over in Williton. So uh, Williton, Parkwood, Rostrata. This is um, Waleri Drive coming down towards Row Highway from Riverton Shops up here. And this was how the basin used to look. We're currently working in it at the moment because it's got a weed growing in it that's a nightmare. But anyway, that's another story. We did, this is before the restoration, so when the water, when it rained, um, it filled up like that. It had no sedges, no rushes, no nothing next to it. Uh, Melinda Snowball was the uh, project leader for this. She's now our graphic designer and does uh, at Circle and does all these beautiful drawings. Um, but she was learning on the ground in land care at the time and so this was her project within Bannister Creek. So that's 2012 after restoration, just beautiful. Lovely to live next door to it would be. And there's your sedges growing now um, in 2022. Unfortunately, we do have a 
a weed that's come from the aquarium industry that has invaded this basin and we're doing a lot of work there with the city at the moment to try and sort that problem out. It's going to take some time. This is another lake. Oh, look at that skinny bottom there. Um, these were the days when I think in the background there might have even been the pub might have still been there. Um, this is Edgware in Linwood, just on Metcalf Road. Um, Wandara Hall, there's a new um, bi uh, kids um, skateboard jumping track there, uh, just over behind that. That's before that was all built. Um, that's what we had, a basin filled up. Um, prior to living where I used to live, where I live um, now, on Bannister Creek, I used to live just 150 metres away from that lake, so I knew it quite well. We started restoring it. To my dismay, the city installed a concrete edge, which they've learnt not to do that now because I made them pull it out eventually. <laughs> and it's not very nice to have to pull that out. It's a horrible job. Um, I think part of the process is sharing, trying to engage others in that same vision that you have. That's the tricky, that's really hard. Why is the concrete so bad in this situation? Well, because it's, it sets a line to say, that's all that poor waterway deserves. We'll have grass right up to that edge. And that was obviously, they had no idea of how much those sedges would grow. And we do. And so, but you're dealing with different departments. There's a landscape, parks and landscapes versus natural areas. And so, yeah, there's always a bit of a challenge there. But there's nothing like proof in the pudding, you know. You just, you get it, you get it eventually. And then they go, why do we do that? So, yeah, well, you know, that was just, it makes it nice and neat. And the real I reason is so that the mowers don't go any further. But the mowers hate it too, because if they hit it, it blunts their blades. And the whippersnippers don't like it either, because if they hit it, it rips off their cord, you know. So, oh, I don't know, somebody likes cement. Um, so we're already planting this side and um, Swan River Trust person there and the, the groups come out and help with the planting. So that's what it looked like, told you it went thick and beautiful. Lots of Lateritia, lots of um, Hypercalama, um, which is this little half quad quadrifidus, half um, bottle brush just beautiful. And if you're wondering what the pink is on the water, anyone know what the pink is Azola. on the water? Azola. Azola. It is Azola. It is a native fern. Tiny, tiny, tiny little fern. Two bits would fit on my little fingernail. And it's a beautiful plant. It does lots of excellent work. Taddies love it. Uh, the ducks don't mind it. It doesn't mat so that you can't, the animals can't move through it. Um, it's, and it shades the water. It turns pink because it's got lots of um, nutrient in the water. It's the only reason it turns pink. And then it collapses and some councils remove it to get some of the organic matter out of the waterway and they just use it as mulch. That's okay, that's fine. But it'll come back. No doubt it will come back. So we had a gap in our work in the main waterway and quite a big gap. We had done quite a lot, but there were some big challenges. The hard bits had been left and they were the bits that had um, blackberry and other weeds five, six metres tall. Really hard work to do. And then along came one clever lady who saw a, who met up with a federal government uh, 
potential federal government politician who was trying to get into politics and trying to get into uh, power. And Pat, we met with her on the veranda of Circle, didn't we? It was amazing. It was amazing. And she said, she opened her mouth and said, so, I sort of said, what I want. And I want water for the, you know, I want to fix these waterways. And she said, well, how much money do you want? And I went, mm, four million? You know, that'll give us a really good start. And she said, all right then, we'll go looking for it. And then they announced it in their election promise. It became a promise. And then they got in. It was the Rudd government. And they got in. It was like, yes, <laughs> they have to honour that promise. We had to fight to make sure they honoured that. And we met with Penny Wong. And you have to meet face to face. You have to, you have to fight the fight for the environment. You know, you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for making the place a better place. And, and um, so, long story short, it's kind of short. Um, in 2012, um, it was, didn't all come to Bannister Creek. Bannister Creek was one of the projects, one of the million dollar projects. And we had one in Canning, one in Gosnells, one in uh, Armadale, we had two in Gosnells, didn't we? Two I think there was yeah, different sites, and we worked out, you know, where the money needed to go, and um, and so the plan was put in place to undertake a revitalisation of this section, which is Iverston Road here, Iverston Road towards High Road. That's High Road running up there. That's Metcalf Road running in the middle and this is Hybanthus Road running along there. So it looked like this. <coughs> in the middle, this is, you've seen this before. Um, that's what it looks like from the top of the waterway. We had done upstream, but we hadn't done downstream. A portion of upstream had been done. Um, so this is what we did. Put in some big boulders, flattened the edges, put in some riffles like you've never seen before. Very unique process. What we were doing is we used upside down culverts and we actually put sacks of um, red iron enriched wood chips with the idea of them attracting phosphorus out of the waterway. So they were put in sacks and we put a lid on the top and we turned it into a riffle, built, had to, had to build some walls, which we hate walls, but we had to do them because it was so steep. So it gives you a bit of an idea of what happens when you're m working with a big machine and lots of rock. Um, we were really concerned that turtles might get in there and so we had to design them in such a way that um, they can't get in, couldn't get in in the first place. Um, and we certainly never had that problem. Um, so that's what it looked like from that view, back up the waterway. And there it is in full flow. And my nerves were starting to settle. Um, again, you can see the frothing occurring still happens today. Um, the reef edge is growing rapidly, 2013, so only two years and it's really, really thickened up. We'd had the benefit of all the knowledge we gained in the previous works and um, it starts to look real natural um, by 2021, 2022 just to show you that the foam is alive and well <laughs> and still there. That's November. It's only about what, 80 metres from my house. So it's not hard for me to spot them. From now on, I'm going to put a sign up on there. I can't get anyone to do it, so I'm just going to laminate a sign and ask people 
to make a report every single time they see the phony because I've been told by the organisation that was I've been trying to get them to do something about it that they haven't had enough reports to warrant it after 20 years of trying to get something done. It drives me crazy because you get new people, you see. They don't know what we've done for the last 20 years. They don't want to find out either. So that's what it looks like. It's a gorgeous spot. It's one of my lovely meditation spots. I've got a little log down there that I can get down and sit on. And <laughs> I was sitting there the other day, quietly in the morning. It was beautiful, absolutely lovely. And something touched the side of my leg. <laughs> and I just about jumped off out of, into the water thinking it was something. And it was a dog. <laughs> Somebody's little dog had walked past and just touched my leg. Hadn't made us, oh, I was probably in La La Land. But yeah, it really frightened me. But it's a beautiful place. And so we're creating these lovely spaces for people um, to chill and to look after mental health and look after people um, who live in this area as well as looking after all the insects and stuff and environment. So this is just a little bit further down. Talked about walls. We still have a problem with this in here, cat. That's a challenge for us to do something about with the city. I, we, I think we need to dig the soil, some of the soil out and start putting in some soil with some guts so that some plants can get growing. Once they get going and they get their roots down, their roots themselves are a conduit for moisture to move down into the water. So um, anything, any of these hard structures are difficult to manage, but it's better than having people falling into the waterway. At least you can walk around. So a little bit further down on the other side of um, Metcalf Road, we had another challenge. We'd already done a little bit of an experiment um, in that section. The guys came in and did, um, uh, went in and did some brush cutting just to see, we wanted to reduce the amount of chemical used and sort of see if we could brush cut everything down, all, the, all of the, the, the weeds and vines down. And so Dave from, and Jake got in there themselves measured out a plot of space so we could also cost it. We had no idea what it was going to cost. And we were thinking it was going to cost, um, I think I put in the thing, $50,000 just for one section. I think it cost us fifteen, And that was the whole section. So it was a very effective way of doing um, removing blackberry. Um, rather than uh, poisoning it. We only used a bit of chemical on the regrowth um, of a mother plant with roots in the ground. And we didn't get much of that because we back flooded it. Quite by accident, but we did. Um, it was an engineered accident, I should say. We actually built the riffle further down a little bit higher than what we intended. It wasn't a, we couldn't let it flood back to the bridge because you've always got to have water coming through. But the back flooding, we decided to leave it too high for 12 months when we realised that the blackberry wasn't coming back. And that if we rotted the blackberry, we would get rid of a whole lot of problem. And then we could drop the riffle by just moving rocks. It's just going in and moving rocks. Kids will do that anyway and it will settle a bit. And it did. And we did move rocks, but um, it's a beautiful area. So that's the same space, <laughs> would you believe? Um, it's hard to credit. Um, it's filled up and now the photos, every photo will look the same, basically. <laughs> We did lose a few trees. They didn't like being flooded, even though they're flooded gums. <laughs> but they obviously hadn't been that flooded for that length of time and weren't used to it. 
So we did lose, but they became, dead wood is really good in a waterway too. They became nice resting places for the for their um, birds. So this is a little bit further down. This is Hybanthus Road and we're looking upstream and this is the, what we call the trash rack. So it was put in there by Water Corporation. There's two, three big culverts that go under Hybanthus Road. Um, I did have a dream that we would take that culvert out one day and just have a big wetland there and close off the road either side. But anyway, that's my dream. Um, I'd better keep it. That's the problem we had. The trash rack would fill up. If we had a high tide, the tide comes up to this spot because the um, river's quite a way away down here, but it does happen. And a high flow and those houses over there have water touching and going into their backyards, sometimes into the house. Um, so we really needed to fix this problem and um, it wasn't going to be fixed by my wetland. So that's what I mean, that's what happens in a storm event and that's all of the horrible stuff from the industrial estate. That's the scum, it's stinky, horrible, oily, yuck stuff. And the trash is doing a good job of filtering it out. Um, but then that has to be taken away. It's now full of typha. That's a bit of a problem because typha has now been um, naturalized. <sighs> regarded as a natural plant. It's naturalized. So you have to have a license to remove it. Um, it's a bit of an issue, um, but um, it's filled. Uh, it's still doing lots of filtering. There's still a lot of habitat there, even though it doesn't look very nice. Um, from some people's eyes. That's what was there before. This is the area I just photographed, I've just shown you is down here. So this is looking down. Um, that's what we had, walls and walls of um, morning glory and other ivies growing over the top of Blackberry. And underneath this is a wall of silt that Water Corp have put there when they used to clean that drain out and drop it out over that side rather than taking it away. And uh, you can see the erosion here. Um, lots of problems in this waterway. <coughs> we put a riffle in where that erosion was, picked a nice straight point and um, created a backwater so it slows the water down and then we can direct the water straight down towards that drain. Um, so it doesn't bounce around, but also the riffle pushes the water out into the floodplain, which is what you want. That's a floodplain, that's what it does. And so now it gets really, really wet and really full. That's what it looked like in 2013, just two years, just a year down the track. Nature's really, really forgiving, very forgiving. Um, more forgiving than we are. And um, it grows, the plants grow if you put the right plants in. We monitor it. We don't know if it's a living stream unless we know what's in it, what was in it before. We did the monitoring. The benefit of this project that we just did, the Urban Waterway Renewal Project, was that we actually had money for monitoring, proper monitoring done by the Department of Water, thoroughly done and it gave us a really good 12 month picture of really what happens in a waterway before you do a restoration and after and the results are resounding and that's a very, very good. Um, we did mussels, we did insects, we've done canopy cover, um, and of course birds, the birds have been monitored for a long, long time by Birds Australia volunteers and the Canning River Regional Park um, people as well. Um, we did macroinvertebrates. This is Benita, she used to work at Circle. And um, it's, you know, through that monitoring, 
you build confidence in the community that what you're doing is working. We had to prove at the end of the day that it was a living stream. How do you know if it's a living stream? Got to have stuff living in it. It's pretty simple. Not just plants, but a full ecosystem happening. It's not perfect because it runs off an urban landscape and we only need one big pollution event and we can set it back. Yes? Do we get problems with people using wetter soil? We would never be able to monitor that. Wetter soil is uh, often detergent based, some of them are, but you can get some that are not. If you put wetter soil with a detergent base on your lawn and on your gardens, you will not have frogs. You will not have earthworms. They don't like it either your earthworms will go real deep to get away from it. So just remember that their outer skin is their lungs. So you're literally putting detergent on their lungs and turning the skin into a permeable... So instead of it having a, some sort of water resistance, chemical resistance, it's turned into an open slather sieve and the frogs die very quickly. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of issues um, associated with um, that sort of, you know, just adding organic matter does the same job. Yeah. So, in conclusion, we have changed the place. Um, there's now 19 hectares of densely weed infested paperbark wetlands not weed infested anymore. Um, four kilometres of riverbank and floodplains, that's just the waterway itself. That's not those other catchments that we've worked on, other ponds and things we've worked on out in the catchment. A massive 10.5 hectare upstream wetland, Tom Bateman, was created and Bannister Creek was, our part in that was the re uh, revegetation. We got the funding to put all the plants in and we were able to witness Mr Tom Bateman, the man who had owned the land, who was in his 90s, actually put in the first plant with <laughs> Carl. And so it was lovely. 650 metres of lawn and concrete drain fully restored um, in the ups upstream catchment. Here I've got more than, greater than a million plants planted Today, that was from 2016, and today we did a little bit of a calculation. We added another um, nearly 100,000 to that list. So, um, upstream basins, fully restored, catchment-wide education programs. We were out in the schools, changing the way schools teach, um, and that's been carried on through uh, circles work and um, and this sort of work that's now done um, and building um, our, our kids, um, the education into the children. We just need to get that education back into politics and into our, our government infrastructure. It's just been lost. The nutrient flows reduced significantly. Nitrogen 44%, phosphorus 50%. That's the reduction. Um, from 11.8 tonnes per annum to 6.64 tonnes per annum. Now that's as of 2017. So there has not been much work done on that in the last five years, six years. So we don't really know. We need, an, uh, sorry to say this, but we need a big, big fish kill mm. in the swan for us to do anything about it and invest in the Swan River and the Canning River. Huge increase in bird species diversity and plant biodiversity by 70%. Wasn't hard because you just have to go from lawn to um, putting food plants in. That was hard, it was really hard work. Increase the bird species um, from 33 to 46 and the number has gone up as well. We've got reptiles, we've got snakes, we've got frogs, we've got uh, turtles breeding, um, 
we've had a huge amount of invertebrate diversity um, has increased and it keeps changing. We had blue banded bees rocked up last year and I hadn't seen them. Local residents' lives have been changed, as I said, and we had this lovely scientific proof that the change at the Living Stream site actually did increase the value of the houses around it. So before we did this, I had this big idea of saying, trying to get to real estate to say, can you, can we get a baseline? Oh yeah, the baseline's always there, but I was a bit scared that it wouldn't be when we came to doing the work and because I knew it was going to be a couple of decades before we could see a change. But then somebody, a, a professor came along and did a study and it was wonderful because I had all of that pre, the questions we'd asked people, I had all that pre-survey stuff done. Um, and that's really just what I thought was common sense to actually have a baseline to prove that what you're doing is good. And um, yeah, and an increase by 18%, that's, that's significant. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say I had a pecuniary interest in that. <laughs> um, but it wasn't my intention because I'm not bloody moving anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the other effect is the effect it has worldwide. Um, I went down to Albany, um, I was invited or asked if I'd go down and talk to a group down there many years ago now and um, got down in the drain because no one had actually got down in the drain. I made them all get off the edge and come down in the drain and be in the drain to see what you're really dealing with when you're in there. The height of it, you know, to pretend you're a... You're a um, turtle and trying to get out of that and this was with the councillor, council people and the local community were trying to push for this change and so they'd seen what somebody had been up and seen what was done in Bannister Creek. I happened to be going to Northcliffe and I ended up coming back via Albany um, and so actually it was this coming weekend, it was a long weekend, it was after a long weekend and so walked in there, went it through with them and then came away and thought, oh well, maybe they'll do something. And then they sent us this picture when they'd done the work um, and it actually states there um, that it was, um, that they had used, the, they've got the photographs there of the Bannister Creek photos. And so that's a real, so I'm like, right, what you're doing is making a difference elsewhere. And um, then it goes on from there. You can't stop it once you start. So it's awesome. Whoopsie. So yeah, on, on the top of that, sorry, I didn't say that $3.61 million was spent. Um, it's a lot of money. Not too much, if you say it quickly. But we got all those volunteers, all those people, the, the amount of volunteers that create 1.150, and it's more than that because we had it written up on here, but somebody covered it up. Um, <laughs> it was an extra 400,000 since 2016. So it's ongoing. It keeps on happening. And... We also leveraged more money into the area because you don't get investment unless you've got some funding and then you go out getting money from the city or from Water Corp or from... Where, good luck if you can get money from Water Corp, but um, anyone who's willing to put their hand in their pocket. And people are money. People are your the answer. And, um, you know, it's just great to have people involved. And so that's it, really. That's the story. Um, I just hope that we can keep these urban landscapes valued and that we put an effort in and that we don't worry about money being spent on them because if we don't spend money on them, we won't have these little fellas around anymore. Look how tiny that is. And um, it's worth it.
the actual feeling that you get walking down there, even myself, because I see all the weeds and things. That's just something you have to put your blinkers on. That's a disease of working in land care. Once you realise what's a weed and what's not, looking at the bush is not the same again. So it changes you forever, wherever you go. And so for me, when I got sick, which eight years ago it is now, and believe me, I was given two to six weeks to live, and um, we had to do some quick repairs and quick preparations. Um, I never really believed it, but for the disease that I had, I knew as a nurse that it would, could take me out and it would most likely take me out in six months. And then nature took over and a lady by the name of Rose sitting at the back there and next to her Sandy, you don't know who's around you, who's going to be there for you when you hit such a huge, massive bombshell in your life. And pulling on that power that you've built within the team has been a huge strength. And walking down there and sitting, and putting my feet in that water, touching the plants, being near the trees, immersing myself in it was so powerful. And in the canning, I used to come down and sit at the canning, sit on the, you know, to get the energy so that I could cope with the chemotherapy that I needed to have. No surgery, just lots of chemicals and lots of natural stuff as well. Huge amount of work and it's worth it because yesterday I had my 299th chemotherapy. It's ongoing. Number 300 next, year, next week. I hope they make me a cake. I'd be <laughs> really annoyed if they don't. Um, but that's the story, you know. That's why I say through my healing, I have lent on what we've done and what we've healed here. And so what you do is, is just grow that strength and grow it stronger. And, um, and that's it, that's the story. I hope you enjoyed it.